videos. How are you gonna get an admissions officer to just stop and look at your work just a little bit longer? One thing you guys can do is very few people have 3D artwork. If they do have 3D artwork, they probably just have one piece. And a lot of the times the 3D artwork is not that great. I think what's really hard about 3D artwork is that oftentimes people don't really know what tools to use, even what materials are available. But a piece like this is made totally out of chipboard. Chipboard is so cheap, you guys. It's like a dollar for a pretty large sheet of it. You can buy a lot and all you need to make this particular project, which by the way, we have the video tutorial on artprof.org. You just need a utility blade. You can even just use a pair of scissors, but that and basically a hot glue gun and you are good to go. So this is a great tutorial you guys can take a look at. This is another tutorial we have on artprof.org and this one is a foam board staircase sculpture. So this is actually a really good one for those of you guys who are really interested in architecture, doing something a little bit more geometric. Or if you guys have a ceramics class at your school, wonderful to get ceramic sculpture in there. I mean, this is sort of a sculpture slash teapot at the same time. I mean, whatever you guys can do, but that's excellent if you guys have access to a kiln. By the way, if you guys are just joining us, please feel free, drop into the chat box, ask me your questions. We are talking today about what you guys can do to stand out in a portfolio. So I'm gonna show you pieces of artwork that have a particular format or media that I tend to not really see very often. Oh, hi, George. Oh, good, finally, you found me live, excellent. So here's another project. This is a balsa wood sculpture project that is also on artprof.org. And balsa wood is such a friendly material. Wood carving is such a pain. You need lots of specialized tools. Balsa wood, you just need like sandpaper and a utility knife. And we do have this tutorial on artprof.org. So like I said, the problem with 3D, people don't know what to work with. And if they do have something they wanna work with, they don't know what tools to get. They don't know what technique to use. So that's why it's really great for you guys to reference some of the 3D stuff. Because anytime I see 3D in an art school portfolio, I go, whoa, they have 3D. <laughs> and it's even better if they have 3D that's really strong. I mean, definitely I've seen a lot of 3D artwork in portfolios. That's, yeah, it's okay. You sort of give them brownie points because it's 3D. But if you make a 3D piece that's like really technically accomplished, that will definitely make you stand out. Another cool thing is artist books. I don't see a lot of these. I see a lot of people with sketchbook pages and you guys definitely should be showing some of your processes in terms of brainstorming and developing your concept. You definitely wanna do that. But a sketchbook is not the same thing as an artist book. Oh, George is saying they ordered chipboard. You wanna try out the chipboard project to further diversify more portfolio. Yeah, have fun with that. The chipboard is such a friendly material and it's very easy to manipulate. Like you can sort of sculpt with it in a way. It's a lot better than paper because I see a lot of people, they have their students do like paper sculptures and certainly you can do great stuff with that as well. I'm not saying that paper is not a good material, but I really like the durability of the chipboard. Oh, hello, Ken. Hello, Lizzie Annie. Thank you guys so much for joining the stream. So this is a Lotus Fold book project, and this is also on artprof.org. And even better, on top of 3D stuff, if you guys have wearable sculpture, this is really cool. This is a copper tooling project that we do have on artprof.org. And you can see, this is just a sheet of copper foil and if we look at the next slide, you can see this is what it looks like when it's actually worn. Because what I see a lot in terms of clothing in portfolios is people will be like, oh, I made this t-shirt, or oh, I have a pair of jeans and I painted them, or I painted my sneakers. Like I see a lot of that. Or I see people making apparel pieces, but they're not like actually constructed by the artist. Like they just painted it. And so if you make a wearable piece, where you really are responsible for the construction of the piece. That I think really stands out. Another thing is here's another piece, and this is same technique, this is copper tooling, 
And this is such a cool piece because I think a lot of people, when they think about, oh, something wearable, the first place they go to is the arm because I think the arm is sort of the most obvious. It's the easiest one to work with, which is why I love this piece because it's wrapped around the knee. It's like such an unusual, strange place to have a wearable piece, but that's sort of what makes it a little bit more unusual. Oh, hey, Dorinka. By the way, you guys, if you're watching, this is Dorinka's piece. And all of the student artists whose artwork I'm showing you guys, all of their links are in the video description below. So you guys can go check out their work later on, but I was really thrilled with Dorinka's piece because it's like beautifully designed and it's, it's just a very unusual place because like I said, a lot of people, they, oh, everybody wants to do a necklace piece. Everybody wants to do one on the head. Like that's very standard. And so if you think about, okay, what is the more typical response? And then you don't do that. That makes a really big difference. All right. So we also have, this is the Lotus Fold tutorial and artist books, you guys are not difficult to make. Okay. It just takes time because the thing about when you make an artist book is that craftsmanship really, really matters. Like there are definitely 3D projects where, yeah, craftsmanship is good, but it's not like the end of the world. But I feel like with artist books, if you do a sloppy job, it's super obvious. So just make sure you take your time. And then if you want something that's more like a traditional bookbinding technique, we do have this project, which is called Coptic Bookbinding. And that's where you're actually taking a needle to thread. And I have to say, when I was shooting this tutorial with Eloise, like I don't know anything about Coptic bookbinding. I was like super intimidated because I'm like, how does she know what she's doing? And I remember my test run for this tutorial. I was like, okay, I edited the tutorial. Now I'm actually going to watch it and try to make a book on my own. And I was like, oh my God, what if it doesn't work? <laughs> then my tutorial is like not gonna happen. And you know, it worked. <laughs> I was like, wow, I actually made this. Like, I mean, granted I wasn't like doing it while the video was going at the same speed. I had to like stop and pause quite a bit, but I was like shocked <laughs> that the tutorial actually worked. I know I shouldn't say that about my own content, but <laughs> it's totally true. Um, another thing is printmaking. Printmaking, I feel, is probably even more rare to see in an art school portfolio than sculpture. Although, I don't know, I suppose they sort of compete, but I almost never see prints because I think printmaking is just sort of a more unusual material. Again, a lot of people are not familiar with the process. They don't know what materials, what tools to get. And the thing about printmaking is you can't just like make it up. <laughs> like you have to really know what you're doing. Like George was mentioning that they bought the chipboard to make the chipboard sculpture project. I mean, that project, you really can wing it if you want. Like it's okay if you don't really know what you're doing, but with printmaking, it really matters. So for example, this is a linoleum block print. And I feel like a lot of people in high school do have sometimes the experience to be able to do this because a lot of art classes do show this particular technique. And the thing about this technique is that you just have to make sure you get a block that's mounted because 90% of the time, the reason why people have trouble with this technique is because they have an unmounted block and their unmounted block warps and it's horrible to print. So I would just make sure that you guys get a mounted block. I know it costs more, but it is worth it if you can afford it. So here is the linoleum block printmaking tutorial that we have. Pretty straightforward. I show you guys a really fancy technique where you can actually get multiple colors from the same block. I mean, you don't have to do that. You could totally do what this artist did, which is just one straight color. And sometimes it's a little bit more simple, but again, if you want it fancy, there is a way to do this. And I do explain step by step. So if you guys want to check that out and the nice thing about linoleum printmaking is basically any regular retail art store is going to have these supplies. Some of the other techniques are a little bit more unusual. For example, we do have this project, which is on jelly plate monotypes. And this is super fun, especially if you like to paint. This is a great technique for somebody who loves to paint and wants to try printmaking. The only thing about this technique is that you do have to buy a jelly plate. It's not difficult to find. You guys can just go to Jelly Arts and they provided supplies for our tutorial. They're a great company and you can just buy one of those online and then you're pretty much all set. Like the other stuff will totally fall into place. But printmaking, this is how to stand out, guys. By the way, if you guys have suggestions 
for things you guys think you can do to stand out, whether it's the format or the subject matter or the material, jump to the chat box and let's all like share notes. So that way people get different ideas from each other. Cause I think that's one of the best parts of these streams is that you guys are all here together and you can ask questions and we can pick each other's brains. Lizzie Annie says, I'm doing a linoleum piece right now. You don't know how to start. Okay, well, Lizzie Annie, go watch my linoleum block printing tutorial because I go over everything. I talk about the linoleum cutter. I show you how to switch the blade out. I show you the correct positioning because the thing about linoleum block printmaking, it's not difficult, but you definitely can do it wrong. <laughs> like if you're holding your linoleum cutter the wrong way, you can make it much harder than it needs to be. And also there's a safety issue. Like if you're not holding your linoleum cutter in a proper way, and if you're not using a bench hook, it can really, you can cut yourself pretty bad. So watch the tutorial, if anything, just so that way you don't have to like go to the ER in the middle of the day. So anyway, hopefully you guys can do that. And then also, if you wanna do printmaking that's a little more simple and a little bit less involved, rubber stamps, super fun guys. What's cool about the rubber stamps is that you don't have to use traditional printmaking ink. You just get a stamp pad. It's awesome. Like these are really small little rubber stamps. Just press them on the stamp pad. You can print them many times. It's super, super fun. And these really do better on a smaller scale. Like I definitely would not want to make a rubber stamp that was like, you know, 12 inches by 50 inches. That's a little bit ridiculous. So this is sort of fun if you want to just do a little thing. Let's see. George is saying I did a figure study. Instead of drawing what's in the background, I took the drawing home and sketched out a fun, surrealistic composition. Oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, that's definitely a way that you can be a little bit more inventive with the background. Don't know if that's necessarily a good thing to do, but I had fun. Well, I think it's a good thing to experiment with, George. My thing about combining multiple resources in the same piece is you really have to work hard to get them to fit together. Because I think sometimes what I see, and George, I don't know what your piece looks like, but sometimes people will paint the figure from observation and like really do a very representational job and they go in and do every single detail. It's like a beautiful piece. And then they just like slap in some random pattern in the background that feels like it has nothing to do with the figure. Like that definitely can work against you. It's not something that um, always happens. I definitely have seen people pull it off, but I think oftentimes people don't realize that having those two totally different approaches, one from imagination, one from observation, sometimes it can clash a little bit in a piece. You just gotta be careful about that. Ken is saying, making your own sketchbook is also good to include. Yeah, I mean, definitely you guys can show your sketchbook pages, but I also like the idea of making like an artist book, like the book is the finished product because I don't really see that very often. Like, let me show you guys um, this Lotus Fold book that one of my students did a little ways back. So this is a Lotus Fold piece, but you can see that they spent a long time doing all the gouache painting that was actually inside the book. So this, this in itself, it's not just a blank book and it's not just a painting, it's like a, a book that actually has a painting inside of it. So this is really cool to do. Let's see, Lizzie Annie says, sounds cool. Yeah, books are so fun, you guys. Oh my God. Like I learned how to do this fold because I wanted to do it in my class and I had so much fun making these. Like I was just like making them with my students because it's like super satisfying. I don't know, and I really like bone folders. Like if you guys haven't ever used a bone folder before, it's just like the coolest thing. In fact, I have a lot of the tools here. I don't know if my bone folder is sitting here, but there's all these cool things like got a glue brush, like all this like really pretty like book binding glue. Like there's so many like beautiful materials that are associated with book binding. Okay. Another thing you guys can do to stand out mixed media. This does not happen very much. Or if it does, usually what I see is people do like a magazine collage and then they paint over it. Like I see stuff like that. But this is a really cool painting because it's an acrylic painting. I don't know if you guys can see very well, but at the bottom, she like literally mixed in, I don't know if it's sesame seeds 
it's some type of seed. Maybe it's like bird seed or something. But she took seeds and she actually mixed the seeds like into the paint and then applied the paint to the canvas and it has like a very physical texture to it. Same thing, do you guys see the cactus in the middle? I think that has like pieces of string in it to like show the tactility of the spikes coming out. And so I think mixed media where you really are sort of altering the shape of your paint can be really fun. I mean, to a certain degree, this is like a very sculptural way that you guys can paint. And Lauren Welch, has this acrylic painting tutorial. And this is so cool. She actually, for the longest time, was saving her old coffee grounds so that she could mix them into acrylic paint. And if you guys look in the tutorial, I mean, it really has this like very cool, gritty, almost like primitive surface to it, which is like so amazing. I mean, the painting she does, she actually does this thing this is so funny and I've seen people do this with like an actual pastry bag where she just like puts her acrylic paint into a plastic bag and then like snips the bottom like as if you were going to do frosting or something and she just like pipes the acrylic paint over the coffee ground paint. It's like the coolest painting and then she adds all these iridescent colors on top of it. It's like a really rich, very full sculptural painting process. So I'd really recommend you guys take a look at that technique because that's really, really cool. And then here's another mixed media piece. I thought this was a really cool piece because they basically took that like really thick corrugated cardboard and then they drew on it with a marker and then like went inside the background area and just like tore away at the cardboard to make this beautiful texture. And so this I think was such a great reaction to the material because a lot of people when they think about drawing on an unusual surface, they say, oh, well, I'll just draw on a piece of wood. Or, oh, here, this is a cool sheet of paper that has a pattern on it. That's cool, but this is really awesome the way she really altered the cardboard. Dorinka is asking, are mural paintings great to stand out? Absolutely, Dorinka. I don't see murals. I feel like I've seen maybe like two and, and that's like over years of reviewing a lot of portfolios i mean i'm definitely not like an admissions officer i'm not like not like i've reviewed that many portfolios the only thing i would say Dorinka, is if you take a photo of your mural you should take a photo so that you can actually see the space that it's in because i did have somebody who submitted a mural but they took a picture so that all you could see was the image. And so in the digital photo, I actually had no idea that it was a mural. And so I said to them, look, can you retake the photo so that maybe somebody is sitting in the room so we can get a sense of the scale? Because I feel like for murals, because they are pretty large, if you don't show something as a scale reference in the photo, we really lose the sense of the scale of that painting. And so she actually sent me one later where you did see the whole room. There was like a couch and a chair. There was somebody sitting in the couch. It made all the difference in the world. So that was really, really cool. Oh, Ken is saying hot glue and acrylic paint. Hey, that's super smart. Oh man, I bet you could have a lot of fun with that. You know what, Ken? I'm totally gonna steal that. That's awesome. I'm gonna tell my students about that. Let's see. George is saying, my teacher is a graffiti artist. has been pushing me to try out spray paint. Is graffiti artwork looked down upon in college portfolios? I mean, <laughs> graffiti is illegal if you guys are doing it in the public space. So I would not recommend that. Also, don't you have to be 18 to buy spray paint? So <laughs> I don't know that I can advocate you guys um, doing illegal things and buying things you're not supposed to buy. But I mean, you could, in theory, you could make a painting or something that maybe is done in a graffiti-like style. I don't know that it's necessarily looked down upon. Like it doesn't have the same negative connotations that I think art school portfolios really look at anime with. But I think that you just wanna make sure whatever you do with that, that you're not making it just look like the stereotypical graffiti that everybody does. I think it should be much more than that. And actually guys, we did do, oh, this is a really cool piece. Let me see if I can find it on um, our YouTube channel because there is, actually it's a really old video. It was like one of our first videos 
from a really long time ago. And this student, I think it was an acrylic painting, but she also put spray paint over it. It was a really cool piece and it was very powerful and actually had this whole like political theme behind it that was really amazing. I remember the artist's name, I believe it was Sarah Kim. I'm trying to find it right now because it's sort of an old video. All right, let's see if YouTube's actually gonna cooperate with me here. Man, we have a lot of videos. Although I have to tell you guys, I was looking at our old videos. I just was like, oh my God, like cringing so bad. But I guess that's sort of the whole point with any artist. Like you look back at your old work from five years ago and you're like, oh my God, just like kill me now. So that does happen every now and then. Oh, of course, the one video that I'm looking for, I can't find it. Um, you know what I'll do, you guys, is I will post it in the video description afterwards because I will find it for you guys. It's a really, really cool piece. So let me just make a note about that so that way I don't forget. Okay, anyway, let's get back to some of the other stuff. Um, another thing is you can play with more unconventional supplies. For example, this student did a watercolor painting on top of a sheet of plywood. And then I think she cut like a sheet of burlap and put the burlap on top and then like dripped wax all over the burlap so that the burlap then adhered itself to the plywood. And you can see what's so cool about this is that the wax has this like gorgeous translucent quality and then the texture of the burlap is really cool. So definitely check this out you guys because I think a lot of people think that what they have to work with has to be from the art store but that is so not true. There's a lot of different things that you guys can do that totally do not have to come from the art store. Like actually my favorite place to shop for art supplies is the hardware store. <laughs> hardware store is awesome and everything's so cheap at the hardware store. Like art supply stores are so expensive. When I go to the hardware store, it's really, really nice. Okay, now another thing you guys can do if you really want to stand out from the crowd, guess what shape everybody makes their drawing and painting? Rectangle, right? Some variation of a rectangle. That's pretty much standard. Like if you sit down, you do an oil painting, that's usually what you're gonna see. But you don't have to do that. Look at this piece. This is a really cool piece that was fabricated from multiple strips of wood. I think she must have glued them together or something like that. And then she painted on top of that. So this can be really fun. Doing an artwork that is not a rectangle. That is definitely going to make you stand out because very few people do this. I feel like the only time that I see something that's not a rectangle is when it's a 3D piece. And for obvious reasons, people aren't going to necessarily do that. Let's see, George is asking, how many media materials is a safe amount? Th there's no limit, <laughs> George, you know, eat your heart out. It's whatever you want it to be. I mean, I think my best suggestion to you guys, if you're gonna try something that's unconventional, you're gonna drip wax all over your piece, or, I mean, first of all, be safe, okay? Don't burn down your house in the process. Obviously, you guys have to make sure you're doing it in a safe way, but, um, you got to play around with it a little bit. Like I would not sit down and say, okay, now I'm going to do a finished piece with all these materials that I've never used before. Like do some little test runs, like see how that burlap is going to react to the wax and see how you can do it. Like you really have to have a certain amount of play time with those supplies and then figure out how you can actually get them to work within the context of a finished piece. Here's another drawing. This student made these crown drawings and it's done on top of sheets of corrugated cardboard. And you can see each figure is cut out and I think she like assembled and put them together. And then it's a little hard to see in the slide, but the figures are all tied with string to each other. And so there's this really beautiful physical connection that's supposed to happen because of the string. I mean, basically you guys, in terms of materials, the world is your oyster. Like I just cannot believe so many drawings I see in art school portfolios, they're all in pencil. I'm like, guys, there's so many art supplies that you can draw with. Like, why is everybody drawing with pencil? 
I mean, don't get me wrong, pencil is a great material, but I mean, it's so much fun. Like, it would be like if you decided to go on a road trip and you just decided to eat carrots for a week. Like, I just would die if I had to eat carrots for a whole week. So don't do that to yourself. There's so many cool art supplies. Let's see. George is saying, the girl who submitted a painting painted on rusty saw blades and in a way camouflaged the rust with the paint and texture was absolutely blown away. That sounds amazing, but oh my goodness, be careful with that rusty saw blade because that sounds a little bit scary. MG is saying, what about including whittled slash carved wood pieces in a portfolio? That would be great, MG. I don't know if you were here earlier, but I was showing some examples of balsa wood carvings. We actually do have a tutorial for that. And I would just say, you guys, make sure you're safe. Again, with all these supplies, you guys got to really make sure that you get the right stuff. You're being safe about it because you can get a bad cut if you're not paying attention. Like in this tutorial, I tell people to wear a Kevlar glove on your non-cutting hand. I mean, I was dumb and I did not wear it in the tutorial because, you know, I like to live life on the edge. No, don't do that. Don't do what I did, okay? Get a Kevlar glove and wear it. Really, really important. Let's see, Lizzie Annie said, I laser cut my own jewelry, should I include it? I mean, I haven't seen your portfolio or the piece, Annie, so I can't really give you an accurate answer, but if it's your design and you had it laser cut, absolutely. But I will say the thing about laser cutting is laser cutting is not as easy as it sounds. I think a lot of people think, oh, I just make a design, I show up and get it cut. Actually, Lauren Welch, who is a teaching artist at Art Prof, she had these beautiful coasters, laser cut. They're amazing. Actually, let me give you guys, I'll just put it in the chat box below, um, her Instagram, because she did post those, I think like a week ago or something, and they're so beautiful. But she told me that it took so long to get the right materials, get the right size. Like there was a lot of troubleshooting going on in there. So it's not as easy as just dropping something off and having it cut. There's a lot more involved. So I'm just gonna write laser cut coasters in Lauren's Instagram. And you guys can go check that out because they're beautiful. Um, okay, so anyway, getting back to this other stuff. Another thing that I see very often is a lot of people want to put in graphic design stuff. So I see a lot of posters, a lot of t-shirts, things like album covers, that type of thing, okay? Now, you can certainly include that stuff, but I can tell you guys, first of all, I see so much of it that it gets pretty tiresome. And honestly, a lot of it's not very good. Like, I don't really see graphic design stuff in art school portfolios that I think is like really, really good. Whereas it's sort of different. Like if we talk about painting, I definitely have seen like amazing paintings, but I feel like the quality of graphic design pieces that I see in art school portfolios, it doesn't tend to be that high. And one of the reasons is because a lot of people will like make the image because obviously that's the part that they're the most engaged in and then go, oh, it's a poster. I better add some text. And what ends up happening is they just slap the text on and it has nothing to do with the image. They haven't thought about font or placement or size. And so I think doing a project like this, where it's just the text and you really try to work with the text in terms of scale and color, like this is just a gouache painting. It's just like a gouache exercise. But I feel like everybody should do these more basic graphic design projects because I feel like a lot of people are now doing a lot of graphic design stuff with digital. And digital's great for graphic design. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but I think sometimes it's almost like it's too easy to just slap text on. Whereas a piece like this with gouache and you have to plan a little bit, you gotta think harder to figure out how you're actually gonna place these things. Let's see, Ken is saying, finals are coming up. I'm making a light fixture with wooden reeds and tissue paper. I could include the links to how they look, could be a possible portfolio piece. Oh my gosh, Ken, you totally like read my mind because I've done that project for 
lots of years in the past and I just have not gotten around to making a tutorial. But yes, if you could post a link, that would be fantastic because I'm sure a lot of people would really like to see that. George is saying that they are more of a traditional drawing and painting artist. Would a digital or animation piece stand out in my portfolio if executed fairly good? Yes, but again, like graphic design, I find that a lot of the animation I see in portfolios is pretty bad. Like I, I don't usually see really good animated pieces. So actually what I would suggest that you guys use, let me see if I can pull this up because we do have a charcoal animation tutorial. I can't find the slide. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna send you guys the link in the chat box, because if you're somebody who is more comfortable with traditional drawing and painting, charcoal animation is a really good option because you can really take advantage of your traditional drawing skills, but it's animation. So it's really freaking cool. And a great contemporary artist who specializes in this technique is William Kentridge. And oh my God, I love William Kentridge. <laughs> His stuff is so good. Okay, so charcoal animation, Contemporary artist would be William Kentridge. I'm sure you guys can find some of his animated pieces on YouTube and oh my God, it's so good. Like there's a lot of contemporary artists where I really like their work and I'm like, oh my God, it's so exciting and so wonderful. But William Kentridge, he's one of those artists. I'm like, I wish I was William Kentridge. <laughs> like that's like the depth of jealousy that I feel about how amazing his artwork is. So check him out, look at the charcoal animation stuff. But yes, George, if you do it and you do an amazing job, that will really definitely stand out because again, I don't see a lot of good quality animation. I see a lot of people doing animation and just like putting effects on it. Like I definitely have seen animated pieces where people are like flashing lights and then they like change the colors and it's, it's not really animation. It's just like putting a bunch of filters that are like time-based and I feel like that's not really that interesting. Like that's not really animation. MG said they did leather crafting. I have a few pieces that are my own designs and patterns. Would be a good thing to include. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know what the pieces look like MG. So again, I can't give you an accurate answer about that, but that's great. I mean, I think the 3D stuff is fantastic, you guys. Like, especially something like leather crafting, that definitely takes a certain degree of expertise and knowledge to be able to execute that. Like if you asked me to do leather stuff, I would have no idea where to get started. Okay, so let's go back to the graphic design stuff because here's another graphic design piece. This is sort of a fun assignment. Like they do this a lot in art school where it's like you take a well-known magazine or context and you create your own version of that. So for example, this is somebody's gouache painting that they did based on the Google Doodle. So you could say, okay, well, I'm gonna design my own Google Doodle for the day. Or I know some people will take like the cover of the New Yorker and they'll like design their own New Yorker cover. So you really have to like react to that iconic title, the New Yorker. And actually, I don't know if Rolling Stone magazine does this anymore, but at least in the olden days when I was a teenager, the whole Rolling Stone thing was they have this really flamboyant, iconic um, title, Rolling Stone with very specific fonts. And the whole thing about the way they placed the celebrities on the cover was that oftentimes the celebrities covered like half of the Rolling Stone wording. So you couldn't even see it, but that was sort of their signature way of dealing with the covers. And so if I were to assign to somebody, okay, do a Rolling Stone cover from the eighties, that's probably something that you would want to do. So it's interesting because if you were to do this project, like what I would do is go back and look at like, tons and tons of New Yorker covers and see what style they look for. Look at tons of Google Doodles and see how other people have done that. Sometimes it's nice to do a graphic design version where there actually is some degree of expectation because other times I feel like people are just like, hey, here's a poster for this. Here's a poster for this. And sometimes it's nice when it's something more recognizable that actually has a particular expectation to it. Spoopy is saying they're working on a portfolio with a focus in game art. 
For your portfolio reviews, is it okay if I submit a digital 3D piece for review? Absolutely, for sure. I think that's great. I mean, I think anything you guys want us to look at, I have to say in all this time that I've been doing this, I really have not encountered anything I felt I couldn't say something about. So don't worry about that. Um, it's funny because sometimes where I teach, I have teaching assistants and they're usually like former students. And sometimes students bring in these uh, sort of dramatic pieces or, or, or pieces that are, are sort of tougher to critique for one reason or another, less straightforward. And one of my TAs was like, how do you always have something to say? I'm like, I, I just have to. Like, it's just not really an option for me to tell somebody I have nothing to say. Um, because, yeah, that's not really quite appropriate. But yes, you find ways to do that. Let's see. George has a fairly small welded scorpion sculpture made from metal. Would that be good as a 3D piece to submit despite the size? Absolutely. Guys, size does not matter, okay? Because... I think the important thing, George, is that you show the size in the photo. So for example, you could have one slide of just the scorpion by itself and have another photo of like, say somebody's hand with the scorpion sculpture inside, because I think especially with 3D work, it's really hard to tell scale. It is not bad to have small work, you guys. Like you can have very small work, but it has to be well done. That's the difference. Let's see, Dorinka saying graphic design booklets common in a portfolio. I don't usually see those very often, Dorinka. What I see more often, people tend to do like packaging design. Like I'll see people make like um, packages to like sell a phone or maybe it's like a label for a bottle or something like that. I think the thing about a graphic design booklet is that you want it to be something that's really going to challenge you. I mean, if you think about it, I don't know what you mean by booklet. If you're talking about like a brochure, like something you pick up at a dentist's office where they're like, oh, you have a $5 billion bill. How are you going to pay for it? You know, it's like, it's not that exciting. So I would say just try to pick a graphic design format that excites you. Because I think sometimes when people just pick like something bland, like a poster I think it's too easy to just do the stereotypical reaction. Like, here's an example. This is a project that I used to do in my summer classes a long time ago, and it was a playing card project. So I wouldn't make them do the whole thing. I'd say, okay, you guys have to do three cards. One has to be a face card, one has to be a number card, and the other one has to be a joker. And it was a very hard project because you have to deal with functionality because every card has say like the face card is a cue and then you have to show the suit and then you also have to make it exciting. So what I like about this card is if you guys look at it, do you see how the cue and the heart are very strategically placed? Like they're not just there by accident. Like see how the picture actually like makes space for them. And then if you look at the text at the bottom, you assume that's the name of the person in the portrait and also look at the font. Like the font is so specific. It's that like old Wild West font that you expect to see. And then she's got the outfit to match that. And then the letters match the colors. And so these are some very basic things that I think a lot of people just don't think about. I think oftentimes it's image slap on text. I see that all the time with graphic design. Let's see, Genevi Tran. They're doing their first live figure drawing class. Should I include in my portfolio to show I have experience, even if it doesn't turn out great? I mean, Genevi, I'm sorry, but I don't really know that I can give you an accurate assessment because, first of all, I don't know what your other stuff looks like. Second of all, I don't know what those drawings are going to look like. But I would just say, you guys, you don't have to go to a figure drawing class to draw from life. Draw your friends when they're hanging out you know what's one of the best times to draw people is when they're playing video games. They, like, never move. Or when people are on their phones. Like, I was at this hotel once eating breakfast. There was this one guy who was on his phone for, like, 45 minutes, like, barely moved. I sat and drew him the whole time. People always think that they have to be at a life drawing session to do that, but you don't. I mean, if you guys go on to my inst... Oh, shoot. I think, uh, did we lose that? Hopefully we're still streaming. Okay, let's see. Guys, am I still here? Am I still online? <laughs> I accidentally 
closed my window. Crap. I think I must have closed the stream. Maybe I'm still going. You guys let me know if I'm still on the stream or not. Shoot. Oh, I am. Okay, good. All right. So I guess I don't need my YouTube thing. All right. I'm just going to keep talking then. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. Um, let's see. So Colby is saying... Would using a film I made in AV class be acceptable or garment from a fashion design course? Does it depend on your major or school you're applying for? Colby, if you're just applying for like first year art school, you can uh, submit all that stuff. Most schools that I know of do not ask you to apply as an FAV major or as a fashion design major. You just apply to be a first year. But absolutely, definitely put that stuff in. The only thing I would say, if you put in a film, don't make it like a 20 minute film because they are not gonna watch the entire thing. They're probably just gonna watch like a minute or two. So I would say if you make that film, keep it short because you, you don't want it to be so long that they actually miss a lot of it. And I will say the number one issue that I see with student films they're so slow. Like, I'm sorry, guys, but every year when I was in art school, they would have the senior film festival and I'd always go to see it. It was really, really fun, like getting to see what everybody did. But oh my God, there were some films. It was just like watching paint peel. <laughs> so like, just, you can do a lot very quickly. And it's incredible how long it takes to edit like two minutes of film. Like I was complaining to my husband the other day, some of you guys might have seen me release that cat drawing tutorial. That's one of our average length tutorials, it's like 25 minutes long or something. I'm like, that tutorial took so long to edit. We have other tutorials that are way longer that did not remotely take that long. And so the thing is, I think a lot of people sometimes with film, there's this sort of like, oh, mine's longer. And it's just like, oh, sorry, that, that didn't sound so good. But people are like, my film was a half an hour long. And it's like, just because it's longer doesn't mean it's better. So I would try to keep it short. And then the last thing I would say that I really don't see very often, and I think you guys can probably guess why, is political artwork very rare to see this because I think a lot of people, obviously politics, especially right now in the US is extremely charged. But the thing is what I like about students starting to get into this area or current events is that you really think about your content in a completely different way. Oh, Tammy, you loved our cat tutorial, them in their little sweaters. Yeah, I know, Tor was so cute. Oh, he's so adorable. Like, I have to say, you guys, I'm not really a cat person, but after doing that cat tutorial and spending all that time with Lauren's cats, I'm like, okay, I get it. I understand the cat thing now. This totally makes sense to me. So with politics, I think oftentimes people get worried about like, oh my God, I'm gonna upset somebody. Maybe the admissions committee is, going to be really mad at me because I'm making something political. I think the thing I would just say, you can make stuff about current events, you can make stuff about politics, but you can also make stuff that's historical. It doesn't have to be current events. Like for example, this is an ink wash illustration that a student did, and this was actually based on our tutorial on pen ink illustration. And this is a really cool tutorial because Alex Rowe he shows you in the tutorial how he does research on this story from colonial America. And it's, it's just really fun because he's like a big history nerd. And so it's really fun to see how he combines his research with the image making process. So if current events makes you uncomfortable, pick a story from history and it can be from any culture, from any time period. I mean, oh my God, there's like so much out there that you guys can think about. And then there's other things like very current events. Well, not this piece necessarily. This is from the 2016 election. But um, I think definitely current events, I think, can be very exciting because you can choose something that you feel passionate about or you can choose something you don't know as much about. And sometimes that's also very helpful because then you start exercising muscles that you don't normally exercise. Let's see, Dorinka says, when the video program shuts down and you didn't save the process. Oh my God, Dorinka, how many times have I done that? You guys, you know what's really sad? I know it's sad when you don't save in Photoshop and stuff, but oh my God, I learned my lesson. I was editing video in Premiere 
I'm such an idiot. I was editing for like two hours and I like did not press save and I closed the thing and I was like, oh my God, like, do you know how much it hurts to lose two hours of editing? Like, okay, Photoshop is sad, but like, I don't know, maybe I'm just not a very good editor, but I feel like editing is like, oh my God, so tedious, takes so long. And it just like, is so painful when like things like don't come back. It like made me so sad. Like maybe that's why I like painting. Cause it's like, I can't ever like lose my painting. Like, although <laughs> this is a terrible story. My husband's friend in art school, this is before digital film. This is back when it was like reels of actual film. He had all the films he had made in art school, like all three years worth. He had them in a package to ship home and FedEx lost it. I was like, oh my God, that's so horrific. <laughs> like that's the worst. And it's like, they're not coming back. There's no backup. It's like, they're, it's gone. Like, and it's not like you can like sue FedEx for that and be like, uh, this is worth three years of my education. So that was really, really awful. So anyway, I would challenge you guys to think about history, current events, and actually if you guys want some tips on how to do that, my linoleum block printmaking tutorial actually is an editorial illustration project. So I talk about choosing an article from the New York Times, how to brainstorm it, and so actually this linoleum block print that you guys are looking at here, this is an illustration based on Hiroshima. I think the article was about ginkgo leaves that were like blooming despite all the destruction. I can't remember exactly what it was. It was a beautiful article, but I had to like look up photos of Hiroshima. I had to like research what ginkgo leaves look like. And so it was a really good challenge. Like it's definitely not something that I would have ordinarily done on my own. George said, I've done two 30 minute life contra drawings using two different colored pens from the tutorials on our prof website. And I just say, I'm extremely thankful for our prof. Yes, you can, George, <laughs> say that all you want. I love it when you guys tell me you enjoy our content because like some days I'm doing stuff and I'm like, oh man, like, does this matter? <laughs> like, I don't know, like some days, stuff is so just boring to work on. Like, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. Like, I know I should be talking about like, oh, inspiration and stuff like that. But like, I seriously spent like one weekend just making YouTube thumbnails. And I was like, I just want to die right now. This is the most boring thing ever. But then I was like, you know what? Th this is important, okay? <laughs> this is very important work that I'm doing. I'm still working on them. I have so many thumbnails to make, but it's like some days it's so tedious. Like it just, you just cannot believe like how much is out there. Um, Lizzie Annie, right after this live, I'm watching all these videos. Oh, have fun. Yeah. So I've been trying to like clean up our YouTube channel and trying to fix all the thumbnails and do all that. So hopefully it's a little bit easier for you guys to find what you need, I also added a whole bunch of new playlists. So that way they're organized by like color, by theme, by artist, and hopefully that's easier. And if you guys have any suggestions for our YouTube channel, I am all ears because you know what I did? I think it was a few weeks back. I had a chat group on Instagram and I asked people to help me with YouTube because you know what's really funny about this is that I spend so so much time on YouTube, but it's like on our channel. <laughs> I like do not watch YouTube. And I just was like shocked when I like talked to the students. I was like, so what do you guys do when you want to search for something? And they were like, oh, I look it up on YouTube. I'm like, really? You don't go to Google first? They're like, no, I go to YouTube. I was like, okay, this is like a whole other lifestyle that I'm not aware of. But anyway, in that chat box, people gave me so much good feedback like and one of the primary pieces of feedback was that our youtube thumbnails look too academic they weren't exciting enough and i was like crap what do i do i don't want to redo all those thumbnails there's like over 300 of them but then i was like you know what they're so right <laughs> like they're so right it's so true because it's funny sometimes i watch youtube on the tv because actually the only thing i watch on youtube i watch like stephen colbert and snl and the um what's it called with uh, the, the daily show. That's what it was um, with Trevor Noah. Oh God, I'm like totally having a senior moment. So anyway, we watched those. And so you know how like all the thumbnails show up under all your subscriptions. 
And remember, I was looking, I was like, you know, how come my thumbnails like do not fit here? And I was like, I don't think that they don't fit in a good way. I think they don't fit in a bad way. And so that's how I made that description. So anyway, these are the things you guys can do to stand out. I'm just gonna try to sum this up for you guys right now. So first of all, make 3D artwork and have more than one. You guys can have like two or three 3D artworks. Nobody says you have to stop at just one. George is saying, is it okay to submit pieces inspired by artist techniques while having my own specific idea and motivation? It is, but you gotta be careful because there are definitely times where it's just so obvious that somebody is taking from another artist and you don't want it to be like that. For example, when I went to graduate school, I remember one of the shows, there was a huge oil painting. It was like this woman and a dress. And the first thing I thought when I saw that, I was like, that's a total rip off of John Singer Sargent. And it was so distracting. Like I could not look at that painting and think of anything else. So you just gotta be make, making sure, George, that you are dramatically transforming things enough that people don't look at it and say, oh, they're trying to rip off Picasso. Oh, that's totally a Degas. You, you don't wanna do anything like that. You wanna make it less blatant. So that way people aren't like seeing that immediately. So yeah, definitely don't do that. Okay, so 3D work, wearable art is fantastic to have. Artist books that are not sketchbooks that are actually artworks in themselves. Coptic stitch, lotus fold, printmaking of any form is fantastic. Mixed media that is beyond I painted on a bunch of magazines. Anything which is not a rectangle, something which is an odd, unusual shape. Graphic design that's not a t-shirt, poster, or album cover that really engages with the topography and the image and the text have a relationship. And then anything that deals with historical events, current events, politics, all that stuff that a lot of people tend to not address in high school. I see much more of it in the college level. I feel like in high school, a lot of people just don't wanna go there, but that's why you should, because it's a great challenge for you guys to tackle. Joshua Daniel is saying, what is the number one thing you look for in an art school portfolio? I mean, Joshua, I don't know that there's a number one thing. There, there's a lot of things I look for. I mean, diversity in media is definitely one of them. Like if I look at a portfolio and it's all paintings, the first thing I will say to somebody is you gotta try other things because if you're only doing paintings, what it really says about you is that you're not willing to try anything. And I think schools really wanna see potential. The way for them to see potential is for you to demonstrate that you wanna do more than one material. And same thing with subject matter. Don't have a portfolio which is 18 portraits. You wanna show that you're interested in more than that. And then I guess the other thing that I think sometimes doesn't get talked about enough is consistency. Because oftentimes I will see portfolios where there's like seven pieces that are really good. There's like one really standout piece that's amazing. And then there's like four that are just not that great. And that's kind of a bummer because you look at the portfolio and you're like, I totally know this person is capable of doing great work, but look at how they drop the ball. And so, you have to make sure that the quality is really consistent in the portfolio because it actually makes you look worse if you have great work next to really bad work. So just make sure that you guys keep that in mind. So anyway, I'd like to remind you guys that we have now on Patreon a monthly giveaway. So if you give us as little as $1 a month on Patreon, you're automatically entered in this giveaway. You don't have to do anything. And this giveaway is so cool. If you guys go to our site, you will see you can win a free portfolio critique. You can win an Instagram critique, a website critique. You might even choose to get mystery artwork from me. You don't know what it is, but it's original artwork that I will ship to you. Or Deep Tea has these really cool like temporary tattoos and she's got stickers and all these cool things, or you can elect for mystery art supplies. Now remember, all you guys have to give is a dollar once a month and we can do that. And by the way, thank you so much to those of you who already support us on Patreon. It's so wonderful to have you guys there helping us produce this content for you because I love doing this. This is like, I wake up every morning and I'm like, oh, what do I have to do? <laughs> like, I'm so excited. I mean, it gets a little bit compulsive sometimes, but 
for the most part, it's a very good thing. It's a very energizing part of my life. But I hope you guys will consider contributing because everything matters. Let's see. Last question. George is saying, how many pieces from a series of concentration can be added into a portfolio? I mean, George, I think it depends on if you're going to put multiple pieces on the same slide. Like I would say if you have two images per slide, you could have two slides. I would say like three or four from a concentration. I don't think I'd do more than four. I feel like that's kind of a lot. Like I wouldn't take up four slides from one concentration. I think tops, I would take up three slides and then have other stuff for the rest of your portfolio. But I do think it's good to show a series because I think it shows a degree of focus and depth that I think a lot of high school students don't usually have the opportunity to do. I mean, I definitely did not do that. Like, I feel like everything that I did in high school was like a total one-off and I didn't ever think about working in a series. So I think that's a good thing to show. And let's see, tattoo pieces done on pigskin. I've had the opportunity to do some. Oh, um, you know what? I've never done that before. I don't know what that looks like and I don't know anything about tattoo art. I mean, you guys might look up some art school students who do tattoo stuff because there's definitely ways to like do a fake tattoo or like I've seen a lot of people will do like henna or like Lauren Welch does a lot of like acrylic painting on like people's bodies. Deep D's done a lot of uh, temporary tattoos and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff you can do. So give it a shot. I don't have any suggestions for you. Sorry, you guys might look at what Deep D's done on her Instagram account, see what she's been up to because she's done some pretty cool stuff lately. Okay, so anyway, you guys, thank you so much for showing up. I love chatting with you guys. It's so great to hear directly from all of you what you guys are thinking. And I will see you guys next time. Have a good night.